good evening. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. And I hope in the next hour we can at least talk about some of the long-term and short-term challenges in particular that the Asia-Pacific region faces uh, for the world and for the United States. You know, coming to Old Line is so satisfying just to feel, it's a certain timeless feeling. It's just absolutely beautiful. It brings me back to my mother's childhood uh, home in New Hampshire and my wife's uh, summer uh, vacation spot in Maine. Uh, my wife and I both met at Oxford where time stands still for hundreds of years. We're going to be talking about a region that is moving so fast, is so dynamic, that in the next 15 years alone, in the next 30 years, you will not believe what's going to happen. And this part of the world is what's going to be driving the whole world to a large degree. That circle right now, there are more people living inside this circle than outside, but that's India, China, Southeast Asia, move Australia out. That's already the situation today. This is growing in terms of the locus of economic, technological, military, demographic power in the world. And it's, it's moving fast. Now, geography, history, culture remain. They remain the foundations. They're still very important and they have to be understood. I wish I had time to go into some of those issues. We're going to be looking forward more than, more than backward. But every time we talk about an issue today or even in the future, the past and geography will, will be a big factor. But this is what we're, we're focused on right now and why this region is so important for the United States because if the United States is going to continue to be uh, a power in the world, uh, a source of inspiration, of ideas and innovation, a problem-solving nation, a place that can bring different peoples together, uh, we're going to be having to contest, compete, cooperate with the countries and the people in this region. Now, some of the trends that are changing the world so, so rapidly have been spelled out in various places. One book that I would recommend is called uh, A World, or no, The World Declassified. The World Declassified. Um, and it's a book by uh, Matt Burroughs, who came out of the CIA, and is now at another think tank, the Atlantic Council. But he has based this on years of working on long-range forecasts. And The World Declassified by Matt Burroughs um, looks at three big mega trends. He actually has five trends and then five different alternative futures. But there are really three big mega trends. And the reason these are important is because my argument is that Asia Pacific and the Indo-Asia Pacific is what is going to be leading in these mega trends for both better and for worse. The first mega trend is the diffusion of power. The second one is about technology, disruptive technology, technology that will change fundamentally the way humans interact. And then third, a category I've called natural security, include resources, climate change, and really the nexus of these issues coming together throughout the rest of the century. So the diffusion of power, there are two basic concepts that we're going to talk about. One of them is we know that state power is being more diffused. The United States is in relative decline, as you would be told, at any meeting in Asia, and China is ascendant. We, we're going to debate that, we can think about that, but the point is that there's state power that is becoming more diffuse in the world. Power is shifting from the west to the east and to the south. But power is also shifting downward to individual empowerment. Rise of middle classes, people with access to technology, living longer, better educated. It's changing the world. State power is not all important. It never was. But in this future world, individual empowerment is what Matt Burroughs thinks is even more significant than the state power diffusion. The disruptive technologies are going to talk a little bit about what might be dubbed the third industrial revolution, or third technological revolution as well. And this is really not just information technologies, but what have sometimes been called the brine technologies, synthetic biology, it's artificial biology made in a lab, robotics, including unmanned vehicles of all types, information technology, more than the computers, nanotechnology, new types of energy, but it's also new materials, it's additive manufacturing, so-called three-dimensional printing, where you can manufacture 
from your printer. Uh, so these things are changing the world, and they're changing out of that circle, that locus of power uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And the natural security, the climate change, complex as it is, is creating lots of challenges, especially when you think about the future of water and food and land and energy scarcity or uh, plenty in different regions. So there are winners and losers in this. In state power and diffusion, it's not just the rise of China, it's also the rise of India, it's the rise of other Asian countries, in fact. Um, but in China and India, you already have 2.5 billion people. And in Southeast Asia, you have another 1.5 billion people, more than that. You've got such a huge population right now, and their economies are continuing to expand, by and large, at a fast rate, fastest in the, in the world. And they are becoming increasingly capable and some, sometimes also willing to play a bigger role both within the region of the Indo-Asia Pacific, but also in the world. The individual empowerment, the new middle class, by 2020, so five years from now, China will have the largest middle class of any country in the world. That's in five years. So the world's largest middle class in 2020 is in China. Um, and by 2030, by the way, China and India alone will have a bigger size of the global economy than all of North America and Europe. So those are at least the trend lines. In fact, trend lines never quite proved to be exact, but nonetheless, this is sort of based on Matt Burroughs' analysis. The technologically connected individuals, the new middle classes, they're going to be changing the world. So multipolarity is one word that you will here in Asia a lot. And um, whether this is basically using four different metrics or measures in terms of the gross domestic product, spending on defense, spending on technology, and the, and the population size. And what this shows is basically how China and India um, are uh, going to be, as they look out from, from 2015 here today, out to 2050, the middle of the century, you have the United States, um, while it's still heading upward, it's still going to be a major power. We're going to be a major power. That's the good news. <laughs> but the bad news, it's going to be very competitive. Nobody will be the superpower. There will be multipolarity. There will be multiple powers. Whether Japan and Russia, especially Japan, really will be that low, who knows? Because there are other factors that determine whether a country is punching above its weight and is powerful. Um, but these countries alone, India, China, and the United States will be very much buying and contesting and cooperating in the Indo-Asia Pacific region because there will be so much wealth and so much innovation going on. Now for some people, it's a US-China competition, a long-term strategic geopolitical competition. This is a Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army caricature of an anti-ship ballistic missile that the Chinese have designed in the last 10 years to hit American aircraft carriers. That's the American aircraft carrier in that picture. It's just an illustration, but there are lots of my friends in the People's Liberation Army working to make that a reality. Uh, it's part of what they call uh, an anti-intervention capability. Americans in the military usually refer to it as the anti-access and air denial strategy and capabilities of a growing China. China is growing. It wants more control and assurance that it can determine the sea lines of its own communication, its own resources, its own uh, uh, core interests, as they would call an issue like, China, like Taiwan. And they don't want the United States meddling in these issues from their perspective. So in 1995-96, there was a crisis over the Taiwan Strait. And the United States dispatched two aircraft carriers to the vicinity of the Taiwan Strait during the Clinton administration. The Chinese backed down, the crisis kind of ended, but the, the crisis didn't really end. Nothing ever really ends. Uh, it, it evolved. Um, and so one, one of the evolutions was for the Chinese military to work very much on systems like the anti-ship uh, uh, anti ballistic missile that in the future would put American high-value targets, expensive ships and planes, at high risk so that they wouldn't be able to send in the Navy so close 
to China. And therefore, China could exert more influence and more control over, in this case, Taiwan. But not just Taiwan. It's all China's interests. I testified on this yesterday. It's on our website, by the way, along with many other things. I testified about the South China Sea. It's a very lengthy testimony. But if you're interested in Chinese strategy, I go into some depth about what's, what they're really up to and trying to explain it uh, fairly. Now, again, just thinking about the future here, if present trends were to hold, according to one very distinguished think tank in Europe, Cipri, out of, out of Sweden, uh, China would, by the 20 years from now, be surpassing the total American defense budget. So the Chinese love to say, well, they only spend only you know, $150 billion on defense. Well, one, it's bigger than that. Two, there's a question of purchasing power parity and what really is needed when you pay your military so little relative to the, the benefits, for instance, of the United States. And the fact that we're still focused on the global force and China's focused more on a regional force. There are a lot of very different ways to compare these two. But even if you did that, you know, by the middle of the century right now, if China were on this trajectory, it's going to be spending much more than the United States. So not only will the Chinese have the geographical advantage in Asia Pacific, um, it will have an advantage in population, but it's going to be spending far more in that region on defense issues, potentially, if this happened. A lot of ifs, a lot of assumptions. So I'm not saying this is a forecast. You don't really predict the future. But trend lines often do show the direction, and that's what we're showing, the direction. So I'm going to talk a bit about disruptive technologies. Um, the third industrial revolution is based on this convergence of several broad technologies, as I mentioned, with biology, with uh, robotics, with information technology, nanotechnology, and energy. Um, and it's when you combine this, as this is Matt Burroughs's pessimistic argument, he's mostly an optimist, when you combine these disruptive technologies with the fact that the, the world is not just becoming more multipolar, but it's also becoming more splintered. No one country is able to persuade the others to go along. And we see this fragmentation of the post-World War II order every day. Russia and China are perpetuating it because it builds up their own power in their own region. But it leads to a, a splintering of cooperation and of the international system such as it is and has been since the end of World War II. If that trend continues, and you have more individual empowerment, more individuals and small groups uh, being able to get hands on disruptive technology, um, this could become and will become uh, very frightening. So there's something that could be called killer robots. There was actually a United Nations meeting in Geneva uh, in last month, the second one, uh, to deal with killer robots. Autonomous, unmanned vehicles that are armed. Now, we already see the United States using these to counter terrorism. But as these things proliferate uh, and could be used by individuals, um, then you, you find that not only uh, can anyone have access to this, but also you have the fact that the human can be out of the loop eventually. The human is no longer going to be necessary. It's, he is still necessary, she is still necessary, but unfortunately, the technology may decide otherwise in terms of what fires at whom, when. Um, and so this, although this looks like science fiction, this has to do with the fact that microprocessing, Moore's Law just turned 50, there's a very good uh, essay by Thomas Friedman on Moore's Law, which back in the 1960s sort of set into motion the thinking that the microprocessing capacity of computers was going to be doubling at a, at a very quick rate. Um, and now the algorithms to write computer technology is actually at a geometrically hugely increased rate. It's, it's, it's a huge comparison. And what th that means is that the artificial intelligence that people are writing today, already today, can outsmart humans and what they're going to be writing in 10 years, or in 15 years, or in 20 years, and what they may be writing already in China and other places, will make these machines, and not just humanoids, they'll be different shapes, they'll be cyber, but they'll be able to essentially make decisions before humans can ever react. That's why it becomes very frightening. How do you regulate and control what's happening with these systems? 
especially when, again, that circle in Asia Pacific, that's where most of this is being done right now in laboratories and universities, in the military, in intelligence areas. Yes, we're doing it also. Yes, Europe. Yes, there are other centers, but they're pouring lots of money into these activities. The natural security, um, again, it's, it's the nexus of these issues. This, this is the Tibetan plateau. So this, India, China, uh, depend on this for water. Water stress in the next 15 years alone, it's going to, we already see it in California today, and it's going to be a problem in half the world by the middle of the century, by 2045. Uh, it's, it's a growing problem. It's a huge issue in China. It's one reason why they do so much engineering of the earth, including the Three Gorges Dam, which you've heard about, it's done a lot of ecological damage. The, the Mekong Delta, which the Chinese run upstream, has affected the Southeast Asian mainland countries uh, in terms of their water supply, it changes livelihoods, it changes the ability to do agriculture, changes the ability to live. Um, this is a picture of the Tibetan Plateau indicating that it's been an extended period of drought, which should not be the case, except that global warming, it turns out, is happening. Whatever is happening, it's happening, and it's, it's changing. And when you put that into the question of rising population, and that's a huge question. Experts don't know what the population looks like out to the end of the century. If the population goes not just from 7.5 to 9 billion, which Matt Burroughs thinks is manageable, but goes up to 11 billion, that may be beyond what the Earth can sustain. So that's kind of a dire warning. In fact, humans have always found ways to adapt, but there may be tipping points when, no, it's really, really difficult for large areas of the planet to, to succeed. So let me talk about these challenges. Um, the, 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 the challenges that we face in the world uh, are emblematic of what we face in Asia Pacific. It's what Asia Pacific is facing. You might think of these as some very old challenges. There's nothing new here in terms of terrorism and identity conflict over food and water scarcity, pandemics and disease, natural disasters. These things have been around since the beginning of man. Um, and they're going to continue to persist. They're going to be big problems for Asia Pacific. Uh, we know that uh, the terrorism and Danielle talk a little bit about uh, Islamic radicalization and even Asia's concerns with the Islamic State, ISIS, and with terrorism outside the region. Um, talk a bit about the uh, growing pressure within Asia as they grow their economies and grow their people and the middle classes. In China, by the end of this decade, Chinese per capita income will succeed, will exceed well over $15,000 per person. They're lagging well behind the United States in terms of per capita income. But $15,000 is seen as a tipping point in terms of middle classes looking for more aspirations, of more control. Well, that puts more pressure on you want cars, you want air conditioners, you want cell phones, you want a lot of things. Uh, and this is going to be a problem in Asia Pacific. The pandemics, uh, we saw glimpses of this with avian flu a few years ago, with Ebola in Africa. In a globalized world, there's a globalized transmission belt. And these pandemics will reach very quickly. There's so much new traveling occurring in Asia. When I talk about the dynamics, and I travel throughout Asia, I travel every month. I mean, there's very good screening at most airports I go to, but then every once in a while, there's no screening whatsoever. So some airports are screening for any contact with West Africa. They want to know whether you have a temperature, they've got sensors sensing your temperature as you walk off the plane. They'll come on the plane sometimes and do a, a monitor check they just did in Australia last week for me um, to make sure that, they were, see if there was anybody ill on the plane. Um, very different. But then you get off into the hinterlands and suddenly, no, there's no control, there's no regulation. Disease spreads very quickly. Um, the natural disasters, think of the Nepal earthquake, think of the 311 uh, triple disaster in Japan, a modern country should be well equipped to deal with a disaster, and it was really through the tsunami, earthquake, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor meltdown poses still a long-term long-term threat. Um, so let me deal with terrorism just briefly in, in Asia Pacific. So we're thinking, okay, I know you talk about the Middle East all the time. Well, the world's largest uh, most populous uh, Islamic country, of course, is in Asia. It's Indonesia. Um, and 
Asia is a nexus for, well, what Xi Jinping would call the, the Silk Road, the, the One Road, One Belt, also that is being built by China in part uh, out to uh, Central Asia into Pakistan, which is a uh, sort of a, a huge uh, reservoir of uh, radicalism. These are the two Japanese civilians who were executed by ISIS earlier uh, this year. And um, a Korean, a young Korean, not a Muslim, was recruited online to join ISIS. The Chinese now claim that they have 300 Uyghurs from Xinjiang and Western China uh, who have joined, uh, at least gone off to fight with ISIS. Um, and they are worried very much they're cooperating. One reason they're spending billions of dollars with Pakistan is that Pakistan has agreed to send those Uyghurs to the Chinese authorities. I think Pakistan may be willing to do that. The problem will be trusting Pakistan when it comes to local groups, the Haqqani network, the Taliban, other networks that the Pakistani generals and ISI intelligence have deals with essentially to protect in the federal tribal areas and elsewhere. There, the corruption problems, the local politics may make it very difficult for the Chinese to influence. But the point is that even in Northeast Asia, but also in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, we have large Muslim popula populations, Southern Thailand, um, the blowback as well from ISIS in Australia, it was just a, a crackdown uh, on, a, on a threat there. It's a problem throughout the region. You can't go to any security talk in Asia without thinking about how do you counter violent extremism again. Very interesting, because post 9-11, when you went off to Asia, the Americans were, we had one message for the world, including Asia, which was, you know, with us, against us, it's, 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 it's um, Al-Qaeda. And Asia shut down and basically said, why are you just focused on Asia? Why are you diverting all your attention to ISIS? Well, now Asia is telling us we need to be thinking more about Islamic State, about some of the blowback. It doesn't mean they want a confrontation the way we confronted Al-Qaeda, but they're, they're increasingly worried about this issue. The Chinese just conducted their very first non-combatant evacuation of international citizens from 10 nations, including Pakistan, from Yemen, in order to protect them from political violence and terrorism. And they're, they're not the only country building up those capabilities. So it's not just what's happening in Asia, it's what Asia will bring and happen and do in the rest of the world as well. The, the modern challenges uh, of territorial disputes uh, assured access to the global commons, that's it's freedom of navigation, but it's also freedom of the air and freedom to use cyberspace and, and outer space upon which our modern economy depends. Um, the state collapse or unification of Korea, the spread of nuclear weapons, including from Korea, but not just Korea, uh, and this concept of hybrid warfare. These are all modern challenges, if you will. So we looked at some of the pre-modern challenges. This is what governments, this is what Washington is facing right now, and this is largely centered in Asia Pacific, we're gonna talk about on the territorial disputes. The access to global commons is especially being challenged when you think about challenges to cyberspace, but also to uh, freedom of navigation. The, the Korean Peninsula remains this potential tinderbox that can blow up in so many different ways very quickly. And nuclear weapons and war, it's still, the Korean Peninsula is still the most dangerous place in Asia because you can have a nuclear war so quickly. Pakistan happens to be on the other end of Asia, in South Asia, also the most dangerous place because it's the fastest growing nuclear power in the world, as the Pakistanis double the size of their nuclear arsenal. And when they try to assure US officials that they have control over the nuclear weapons, don't believe it. <laughs> Nobody controls everything in Pakistan. And when, you're, when your defensive mechanism to control your new nuclear weapons is to put them on the road so people can't know where they are, so the Indians can't hit them, well, guess what? They become vulnerable. They become vulnerable to local threats. That's scary. Territorial disputes. This is Fiery Cross Reef as of a month ago or two. So this is, think in the South, we're in the South China Sea now, where the Chinese have, in the last seven years, stepped up their assertions that they have historical rights. And they put out a map that was created over 100 years ago and that the Taiwanese originally, the, well, the Kuomintang party when they were ruling China, had originally drawn up. Uh, and it said, look, we've got this 11, originally 11 dash line map that covers the, the lion's share, the vast majority of the South China Sea. 
And the Chinese have, in the last six, seven years, been now pushing these claims in a way that they hadn't pushed them before. And they're taking their presence in the northern part of the South China Sea, up in the Paracel Islands near Vietnam, and uh, across Hainan and, and out east, and they're now moving down in the South China Sea. And they're, and they're taking existing reefs, like Fiery Cross Reef, and they're creating what Admiral Harry Harris, the new Pacific Command commander to be, called the Great Wall of Sand. Because China has, the last year alone, doubled the landmass, the existing landmass in the South China Sea. China has doubled the existing landmass in the South China Sea in the last year. Um, and they're not going to stop it. So what this shows, it, it, I have pictures here showing you what this looked like four years ago, five years ago. Most of this construction has happened very quickly. But there was nothing on this reef, and most of it was submerged. So they built it up. This is a huge runway here. This is a 3,000 meter runway. Um, this will be able to dock ships in here. There'll be radars, there'll be anti-aircraft gun. Okay, Chinese say, well, this is our right. Well, except there's one problem with that. This is in disputed waters, right? This is in disputed waters. That's a problem. So this hardly is uh, adding to the harmony of the region. It's certainly frightening the Vietnamese and the Philippines, who are two other claimant states who claim these areas. But it's also pushing down on Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, in a way that's frightening. And these countries are looking for the United States to do more. In fact, they've been asking since 2010, really, for the United States to step up and say something. And that's when then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, drew kind of a line in the water at the ASEAN Regional Forum. That was when the Chinese Foreign Minister looked at the Singapore Foreign Minister and said, look, we're a big power, you're a small power, that's a fact. Well, it may be a fact, but it's not a way to win friends and influence people. And it's very surprising because the Chinese sometimes are very sophisticated and sometimes they're very callous on these issues. But this buildup right now is a race for control. It's a race for control. In one way, the Chinese are trying to preempt international law because the Philippines have taken a, a, a legal case to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. Why have they done that? Because three years ago, to the east of Mischief Reef and Bari Cross Reef is Scarborough Shoal. Uh, it's, it's well within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. It's much, much closer to the Philippines than to China. Uh, the, the Chinese essentially moved into Scarborough Shoal when the Philippines started to assert some local control. The United States government convinced the Philippine government, our ally, to, to de-escalate, to send Coast Guard ships instead of Navy ships, and then to back off. On the idea, the expectation, the Chinese would back off. The Philippines did back off. <laughs> the Chinese have stayed put ever since, and now basically exercise permanent control over Scarborough Shoal. So the Chinese military say, well, we've successfully uh, worked with the United States to exercise extended coercion on, on their ally. And th this is really the model that they want to use. The Philippines panicked and said, well, we can't use brute force against China's tailored coercion, as I called it in various reports, but we can go and seek an international ruling to say, hey, that nine dash line map, that's not based on contemporary international law. Contemporary international law says you have to base it on real land features like islands, not just sort of vague voyage lines, which is what that original map was all about, um, which is not really a claim to sovereignty. It's a claim to where ships were traveling. And by the way, the latest archaeology shows a lot of the ships that the Chinese like to claim historically, they weren't Chinese ships. They were ships from the Middle East, frankly. They were ships from elsewhere. So the, the history is all over this place. There's a wonderful book called Bill Hayden, a uh, BBC correspondent, who did a wonderful book called The South China Sea last year. And he, he distills a lot of the history, it's beautifully written. Anyway, we're not here to solve the sovereign issues. We're here to, though, talk about what are the rules we live by, given the fact that we disagree, given the fact that there are disputes. And reclamation with the idea of fortifying them for the military is not a unilateral act that we'd like to see that contributes to the harmony and peace of the region. So this is a growing area. What we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, months, we're going to see the United States-led, or only freedom of navigation operation. 
that will sail into one of the previously submerged land features that's been built up because there's no territorial boundary or water space or airspace under international law that is afforded by a submerged land feature. It's not an island, it's not even a rock. A rock is entitled to 12 nautical miles. An island, which is defined as capable of sustaining human life, is entitled to 200 nautical miles. Anyway, these are details we don't need, but the point is you're going to see a confrontation. The confrontation is coming. That confrontation will not lead to war. That's the good news. Um, the, you know, the, the, yes, sir? We will. We will, in, we will intentionally confront the Chinese on one of the most vulnerable aspects of what they've done. Because we want to highlight that the Chinese are destabilizing the region by doing this. They're changing not just facts on the ground, they're changing the ground. One Australian academic, Alan Dupont, says they're terraforming their way to controlling the South China Sea. So what can the United States and others do? Well, one thing we can do is say, look, we want to abide by certain rules. And one rule should be that we recognize that this is not yours. And so by having a freedom of navigation operation sail in, we, we, we signal two things. One, you can't enforce this yet. <laughs> yet. Uh, and two, uh, we think that the world needs to know the international law and the judgment that's coming down next year at, at the International Tribunal should hold sway with what the rules are not you changing ahead of time what those rules are. That is, Chinese Admiral Wu, their chief of naval operations, called up our chief of naval operations based on a new communications device that was agreed to this last year. And he had the audacity to say last month, oh look, if the conditions are right, or when the conditions are right, we'll share this for international operations. Well, one, we've heard the story before. This is what they told the Philippines when they occupied Mischief Reef in the 90s. Secondly, uh, it's not theirs to control. And that's the point. That's why there'll be a freedom of navigation operation. There'll be exercises in the region. In fact, there just was. This past month, the Philippines and the United States conducted amphibious operations near, guess where? Scarborough Shoal. So the United States' position has moved more conservatively as the Chinese have been more assertive. And the United States didn't precipitate what China's doing. Chinese capabilities and rise basically precipitated it. Chinese are looking at what the Vietnamese and the Philippines have done, and they said, we need to possess these resources. This is ours historically. They have historical rights. They have a feeling of, being, uh, of injustice, much of which is true. But just because they've had injustices doesn't, doesn't justify the means they're using now to rewrite the rules. So what we're trying to do is to try to use enough pressure and suasion on the Chinese to abide by rules we can all live by. But the Chinese feel like those earlier charts I showed you are, are the future. And if they're that confident, why would they want your binding rules? I want to re I, I, let's, let's just hold off on those binding rules, and I'll talk cooperation over here, and then I'll, I'll reclaim land over here. And that's what the Chinese are playing this both ways, and they'll continue to. It's a balancing act. The United States is a very Western strategically thinking country. Everything we want to do, we want to resolve it, right or wrong. No, the Chinese don't care about that. They care about the balance. And they're, and they're using that balance, manipulating soft power and hard power to gain influence. Why? Because gaining influence is natural. They're rising. It's historical. It's, uh, it feels right to them. The problem is the 21st century is not the 18th century and before. It's, it's a century in which there's a rule of law. It's not just real politique, I will dictate to you because I'm a big power and you're a small power. So this is, this is some of what's going on. And yes, there's control for resources. And by the way, there's a military competition going on that is much deeper than that. What am I talking about? I talked about the Taiwan contingency. And that Taiwan contingency is going to come up again. It's not history. It's coming up in 2016. Because next January, the Democratic Progressive Party is probably coming back to power to a democratic election. The last time the DPP ran, the only time, Taiwan, the Chinese stopped cooperating altogether with Taiwan. And uh, they've had now two terms under Ma ying Zhou, who was in his last year, the KMT party, where they've expanded their economic cooperation, unbelievably. But it's now stopped because of local pressure in Taiwan. 
So when that reverses, the mainland's going to adopt a new policy toward Taiwan after next January. It may not be, it may not be a peaceful policy. It's not going to be an interventionist policy in terms of military. The Chinese are not interested in war. They're interested in, they're interested in winning the peace. And we need to be interested in shaping the peace as well. So that's the good news. This is not the Middle East. The Chinese are not interested in war. The Chinese are interested in gaining influence and control over their environment and over the future. That's not all sinister. It's not all bad. But we're going to have to be engaged very heavily and contesting very heavily to shape those rules so that the system that we helped build up after the war, World War II, is something we recognize into the future, even though we have to adapt and accommodate. So I say accommodate a rising China, but don't accommodate bad behavior. And the Chinese can ultimately live with that, as long as we understand the balance as well. The balance of political forces in Southeast Asia and East Asia, we have to play those as well. So I'm getting into some of the near-term policy. I'm happy to take questions. You want to, go ahead, just sir. What are we prepared to do if they mine that? Well, if they mine international waters, then they're going to have a long-term, they're going to militarize the South China Sea. So if they really want to militarize the South China Sea, it won't just be Chinese militarization. It'll be contested. This space, these semi-enclosed seas, both the East China Sea and the South China Sea, are increasingly contested. Again, think of that circle in Asia, so much happening, so much power growing, and it's getting more crowded. Yes, sir? Well, if they consider that their territory, then they consider it probably okay for them to mine their territory. And if they consider their territory. And the problem is, uh, we're not sure whether they really do consider their territory. Um, they would like us to believe, and like the world to believe that it's their territory. But if you go back to Chinese core interests as they've defined it historically, they have talked about Xinjiang in the West, Tibet, and Taiwan. The question they raised a few years ago is the South China Sea. Is that a core interest? They're testing, they're probing, they're looking for opportunities. In the East China Sea, the U.S.-Japan alliance has essentially countered the moves that China could make over the Senkaku, Daiutai islands. And um, the, the thing is that uh, in the South China Sea, it's open running room. And so what we're trying to do is to try to figure out ways to put up some obstacles to slow down China's sort of opportunism. This is just rampant opportunism. They're just building. Um, and that will change. And eventually, they will have sea and air control. They will be able to mine. They will control that. We're trying to change the rules right now, or at least preserve the rules, before they change the land features on this. But it is a contest. China's not looking for a fight, though. China is looking, it's a, it's a contest and a competition, but they're definitely not looking to fight the United States. They think we're still 20 years ahead of them militarily. We may be, but it's a moot point if they've positioned and outmaneuvered us politically and economically in ways that we really can't move the pieces uh, in this area. The United States is also not spoiling for a fight, I should add. The United States is trying to preserve and adapt the system that we think has benefited the Chinese, will benefit the rise of the middle class, will benefit the United States as we preserve an inclusive rules-based system. And because we really believe that, I think it can work and we can manage these differences. But we're not going to be managing them well if we look the other way when we have fundamental disagreements on cyber intrusions, on these maritime intrusions. And those are going to be the two confrontational areas. There will be a lot of other areas we're cooperating with China on, from climate change to energy cooperation to, to number to trade as well. I'm sorry if I'm skipping over. This is just some of the territorial disputes. Again, these are these are old but modern. So we have up in the very top there is up in the Senkaku. In the East China Sea, I said we, the alliance has effectively countered the Chinese assertiveness there. In, in reality, there's still going, there's still a buildup going on. I just visited uh, the outermost islands of Japan. And so the Japanese are doubling their coast guard at Ishigaki Island, where there are no Americans. It's 500 kilometers off Okinawa. Uh, it's very close to Taiwan. Chinese are very worried about its proximity to Taiwan, frankly, more than they are about who controls it. But they're putting runways for high performance fighter aircraft. And that's where there's going to be a crisis in the East China Sea. There will be an incident up there. But again, it won't, be a, it won't be a conflict in the near term because Japan and China, like the United States, do not want any war. But the Chinese are willing to use some risk. And they've been harassing some aircraft. They've been harassing some ships. 
They use a lot of law enforcement and Coast Guard ships to push and bully their way. And back in 2010, that's when there was an incident when the, the drunken trawler captain from China rammed two Japan Coast Guard ships around the Senkaku Islands. So we can go back and play back why the Japanese nationalized the islands in a political dispute in 2012. It was partly a reaction to what the Chinese were doing. They were pushing and testing and probing who could control. Japan had administrative control of the islands because the United States gave them administrative control when we reverted and concluded the Okinawa reversion in 1972. We had occupied them basically since the end of World War II. Um, and um, the Chinese have been trying to contest that and show, no, we also have administrative control. And it's fine for them to claim that. They should go to the International uh, Court of Justice. They shouldn't look for coercive means at sea and in the air that are dangerous to try to make their case. And that's sort of the line we're trying to walk, the tightrope we're trying to walk. If we look at just the, in the South China Sea, this is a chart. This is now out of date because the Chinese have now accelerated, especially with these reclamations. But these are the number of military in blue and paramilitary, the use of Coast Guard and armed law enforcement ships that China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Taiwan. Those are the six claimant states in the South China Sea. And so the Chinese have by far the biggest number of military and paramilitary uh, incidents since Mystery Free from the mid-90s, you know, through Scarborough Shoal in 2012. Philippines have done a number, Vietnam as well. Taiwan is uh, Ituabu, which is the largest island and runway, although Chinese artificially built runway is going to be bigger. Um, in, in, uh, in the South China Sea. So this just shows you that there's been a pattern, and this pattern has been accelerating, uh, especially in the last five years. I, I'm running out of time. I see that I've not done a good job of uh, controlling the time. I wanted to talk about freedom of navigation in maritime commons in this region, why it's going to be so important to build cooperation and common rules of the road. There already are common regulations. There's something called the coal regs, which basically say if you're a responsible ship driver, whether you're driving a military vessel or a civilian vessel, you have to act responsibly and avoid collisions. So when the Chinese use ships to ram, as they did uh, in, say, against the Vietnam, I was in Da Nang, and I got to see the, 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 one of the fishing boats that was sunk by the Chinese Phalanx, it was a three-ring circus of military, law enforcement, and commercial vessels that the Chinese used to defend the deep sea oil rig they sent off into disputed waters. Um, and um, the Vietnamese sent their fishing vessels out there to fish and to try to uh, enter, enter, enter the rings, uh, which were unlawful because even if the Chinese were allowed to drill, it was, they were only allowed a 500 meter safety uh, circle around that drill in international waters, and they used they used coercion. This is basically the United States doing the reflagging of the Kuwaiti oil tankers back in the Iran Iraq War. I worked on this back in the 1980s. We just we just ran a similar exercise for one week in the Strait of Hormuz. This is because the straits, the choke points of the world, including the Strait of Malacca next to Singapore, including the other ten choke points that are arrayed around China's maritime coast, where they have their three fleets. That's why China needs control, they think. They want control because they are vulnerable to these choke points. Yes, sir? Five minutes. I'm sorry. The Air Commons, back in 2013, so November 2013, the Chinese declared uh, an air defense identification zone over the East China Sea as these tensions ratcheted up. Four days later, the United States sends aircraft into the air defense identification zone, in order to show that the Chinese don't really control the space. That phone op is basically a, rep a repetition of what we did after the ages. The, what the Chinese are doing now in the South China Sea is they're not announcing an air defense identification zone, they're just building it. And if we wait for them to announce it, it'll be too late. Space commons. So back in 2007, the Chinese launched an anti-satellite weapon. Uh, they hit their own target, their own satellite. It created a debris, of war, a debris field of more than 3,000 pieces, uh, which wreaks havoc on space uh, orbiting uh, navigation. 
they conducted a deep space test in the last year and a half. Um, it was a great 60 minutes, two-part episode that just showed last month. Absolutely recommend it. It's amazing what's going on in space. You wouldn't believe it. Um, but that test into deep space, plus the cyber technology that's happening, that's what's led people like former Vice Chairman General Cartwright to say, we have to take our nuclear weapons off alert status. That's a pretty alarming thing to say. Why is he saying that? He's saying it in part because the systems, the technologies, the radars, the early warning communications the United States and allies built up during the Cold War in particular, rely and assume reliable information. Well, what if, you, what if your ears and eyes have been taken out? And what if your cyber space has been corrupted? Do, can we really trust the information? And if you can't trust the information, what do you do? So, this is 2015. It's already here today. Go ahead 10, 15, 25 years. You've already got 11 countries that can uh, shoot satellites into space, including anti-satellite weapons as a result, at least in theory. Um, and so this is a growing problem. The Sony hacking by North Korea of all countries, is, again, is a reminder. But think of the Internet of Things, or the Internet of Everything. What, what is that? Today, there are 15 billion, 1.5 billion devices, like your iPhones, and computers hooked up around the world on the internet. In five years' time, at the end of this decade, there will be five zero billion. Fifty billion things. The internet of everything, they call it. The internet of things, the internet of everything. It means that suddenly cyber war or cyber destruction or cyber malicious activity can grow by an order of magnitude in terms of its impact. And most of the cyber world is not protected. And even the parts that are protected, as we know, are not necessarily protected and safe. So these are future threats and challenges that are, that are huge. Um, a couple of final points here. As we can. The logistics, infrastructure. The Chinese have proposed an amazing infrastructure investment bank. We should be for investment. We should be for development. I think the US government basically mishandled and play on this issue not because the Chinese intended it all to be good. The Chinese were also using currency reserves that they gained from manipulation. But despite that, this shows you how China really thinks about the changing geography of the region. So geography is permanent and enduring, as my colleague Robert Kaplan has written about. But it is changing at the same time because of cyberspace and because of rail, energy, lines of communication, um, so choke points in the Strait of Hormuz and, and down in the, uh, the Strait of Malacca down here. This is where 82% of all the energy flows, of gas um, flows into China. It has to go through the Strait of Malacca. We call this the Malacca Dilemma. The Chinese refer to it the Malacca Dilemma because if they don't control that choke point, it's vulnerable to being cut off. So they've been building up the Shui oil and gas pipelines out of Kunming across Myanmar, Burma, into the Bay of Bengal. It's, it's changing the geography of the region. You no longer have to go through the choke points. You can cut right across the land and then cut over to the Indian Ocean, essentially. So it's changing. Same thing with the oil lines and the, and the rails across uh, Eurasia. It's going to be changing these things. This is the Chinese looking at controlling the jurisdiction of the Paracel, Scarborough Shoals, Spratly Islands, and the South China Sea. This is the uh, fishing vessel in Danang that I talked about that I visited, shows you where it was rammed. The anti axis area denial capabilities of China as they try to essentially push the United States power projection capability outside of Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines and outside of this first island chain, out all the way to Guam to the second island chain, so that China had more influence and defensive perimeter and control over this space. North Korea's future is, uh, let me just end on the North Korean future, because this still remains the most explosive issue in East Asia today. It does not ratify UNCLOS, as it's referred to. But as I suggested, every recent U.S. administration, Republican and Democratic, has abided as a practical course of action by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So, one issue, the Senate ratification, is, is a bit of a technicality. It, that's why I, I argued in my testimony yesterday, we should go ahead and ratify it, 
because it does put us on the moral high road. And frankly, you know, if, if we had to violate it for our national interest, like any other country, we would. But 99 out of 100 times, it's going to be in our interest to have it. And we need it, because right now we're trying to establish rules. Again, those trend lines out to 2050, we need rules more than ever out here if we're going to make sure that we're all living by the same set of rules. Will we ratify it? Not before the next election. The Senate has, has missed it every time by about six, seven, eight votes. Senator Corker, who's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Republican, he said privately he would be willing to do it, but he's looking for the other votes. So there's a mainstream core, but most of the politics in this country have, as you know, moved toward the fringes, not the center. Right. The map on logistics shows you that Asia is integrating. There is integration all over Asia. So this dynamic region is integrating every day with new infrastructure, new mobility, new wealth that brings people together. In general, it's a good thing. But unfortunately, some of those pre-modern concerns still persist, including just historical distrust and animosity between Korea and Japan, between China and Japan, between North and South Korea, just in Northeast Asia alone is extreme. Now, China's relationship with North Korea continues to be watchful, wanting to make sure they preserve stability in North Korea more than they care about nuclear proliferation. But over the last few years, especially with the young general, Kim Jong-un, as they refer to him, uh, they've been more worried that he could destabilize the region. And it's one reason why the Chinese did not reach out right away when he took over, after Kim Jong-il died suddenly. Um, they didn't invite him to China. And that's why his, Kim Jong-un's trip to Moscow was going to be his first trip in three years as leader out of the country. First trip. You're a big international leader, you have nuclear weapons, you haven't been out of the country. Yes, he went to boarding school in Switzerland for a couple of years and didn't do much schooling, but he, he, did, he did see some things. Um, but seriously, on the China-North Korea relationship, the Chinese are increasingly willing to cooperate on watching North Korea on, on, on the proliferation issues. That's the positive. So we have convergent overlapping interests with China. That's good. We've been trying to maximize those. The problem is that China also doesn't want the United States to stay on the peninsula. It doesn't want the instability that would come about by a sudden collapse or change of regime or by a provocation. This week alone, the northern limit line, which is the sea boundary that's disputed uh, in, the, in the West Sea, as the Koreans call it, um, in the Yellow Sea, um, that northern limit line has seen more exercise activity. That's where there was the sinking of the Chonan Corvette, which I visited, which is on display in, in, uh, in South Korea. You can see the, the, the two sides of the hull. Was, it was shot by a homing torpedo from a, a clandestine mini submarine from North Korea and uh, killed half the crew. And a few months later, North Korea started shelling one of the islands that South Koreans occupy. Those two lethal incidents were the last two major provocations that killed people between North and South. China did not like that. And so you can go through WikiLeaks, for instance, if you're so ambitious, and you can find leaked classified State Department documents reporting back on what the Chinese were saying about their North Korean allies, friends. They no longer refer to them as allies. Very interesting. But they still have a close relationship. North Korea is also changing, though. North Korea is not adapting and evolving. It's not standing still. Don't get the idea that Kim Jong-un is standing still. That's why he's strengthened his relations with Russia. That's why he's reaching out through cyberspace. He's finding other ways to raise the economy because he claims he wants both nuclear weapons and economic development. It's not much economic development yet, but he is getting nuclear weapons. One more question. This is one of the hotly debated topics of our time. It's going to be an issue that I'm going to be leading an expert discussion on for our annual conference on the 26th of June, which will be uh, webcast. So look for that on our website if you wish. Um, David Shambaugh, a great China expert at the George Washington University, had an article in the Wall Street Journal last month, I believe, where he said that he's not sure that the Communist Party will survive five more years. Now, the problem with forecasts is that I can give you five Chinese experts over here who will say they're going to make it through, and five over here will say there's no way they're going to make it another five, ten years. Um, we don't know. We know that Xi Jinping, every morning he wakes up, this is his preoccupation. 
How do I retain political control? How do I consolidate political control? That's why he's put himself on every single committee of everything that matters in China, and he's being compared to Mao, not even Deng, as the most powerful Chinese leader of modern times. He's not really as powerful as Mao, but he wants to have top-down control over this very uh, disparate set of actors. There's so many wealthy people in China. There's so many new outlets. The middle class, the tipping point that I mentioned, 15,000 per capita per year income, that's leading to a dissolution of control. It's the superpower individual. It's the empowerment of the middle class and the individual. And when we show this to the Chinese, they don't like that. <laughs> they want no middle kingdom kind of state power. They don't want to hear about this. But do they see it? Sure they see it. That's why they're censoring Weibo and WeChat, which are two of their Twitters and Facebook accounts that they use. And that's why they're clamping down on academic freedom right now at all the universities. They're just going in the other direction. So this idea that China was going to converge with West and is going to be free and is going to manage these, well, maybe eventually. You know, maybe it's two steps forward, one back for their system as well. Clearly, the system has to adapt. Um, clearly, the party will have to adapt if they survive. But it's different from the United States. There's a new book called uh, China Mirage. I was just reading on the plane by, by Bradley. Um, and the son of the famous uh, military photographer and, and world affairs photographer, uh, where he says basically we've had it wrong all along. They were never going to change. They're very different. We misunderstand each other. And if we would understand China better, yeah. and that's the problem. China experts themselves don't agree. So I'm not going to say I know the answer. What I'm going to say is that it's an uncertainty. And you add all those trends and all that volatility and all the disruptive technologies and all the growth and rise, that's explosive. So we better be engaged in this region for the cooperation that it can bring and for the good it can do for humanity, but also because of the destructive power it can bring when there is a revolt and upheaval. Patrick, we have been looking forward to the insights that you bring us on the Far East and you've delivered in spades. And we're very thankful. Thank you. Thank you.